subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon so that you know when live we go hello and welcome to daily news simplified in the next 35 minutes i'm going to take you through today's newspaper the hindu delhi edition dated 12th november 2020 we are going to take up important articles and discuss them from the civil service examination perspective the articles that we shall take up for discussion has been tabulated in front of you and the time stamping for the same has been given in the description section before we proceed ahead there are two important announcement one there will be no dns for coming 3 days on account of diwali holiday dns will be resumed from monday the second announcement is regarding the question that we have posted in our weekly series of mains question assignment from dns on our e learn platform when you go to this tab mains assignment questions you can see the question that is posted today highlight the challenges in implementing the naga framework agreement of 2015 this question has been taken from the dns of 16th august 2020 from the discussion titled hurdles to naga peace you may like to watch the discussion before you attempt answering this question in the description of this dns there is a link for the question assignment where you can participate in the discussion on rao's is e learn platform the link will bring you to this page you will have to click on the question in order to submit your answers there are few important things that you must take care while submitting your answer you can either type the answer in this comment box or you can write on a piece of paper click a clear picture and upload it since in the final exam you will have to write on the paper it is recommended that you practice writing on the paper click the image and upload it here all those of you who will send the answer by saturday will get the evaluation done from rao's is teachers it is very important that you take the picture of your answer sheet in portrait format and upload it in that format if you upload your answer in landscape format then the evaluators will have to bend their neck and any cervical complication that they develop over the period of time you will be held responsible for that also take care that do not submit your answer as a comment to someone else's answer you should submit your answer in the main thread and since speed is of essence in the mains exam keep tab on the time that you are taking to write the answer it will be a good practice to mention the time taken by you on your answer sheet somewhere on the top right you can also mention the city and state from where you are posting your answer this will help us in knowing that students are benefiting across india and dns is reaching every nook and corner of the country so feel motivated show the spark and attempt this question with full zeal and alacrity now i would recommend you to take the self assessment speed test given in the description section get charged up by it and then take the dns this article is from page number 1 Information and Broadcasting Ministry to govern OTT platforms. Government has brought OTT platforms or over the top platforms under the ambit of Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. Presently there is no specific regulation of over the top platforms. There is no law, there is no autonomous regulating body for OTT platforms. although they do come under information technology act 2000 because they qualify as intermediaries and under section 79 of it act intermediaries must exercise due diligence while streaming content but this is not a tight regulation because section 79 gives lots of exemption to intermediaries for example intermediaries will not be liable for any third party information any data or any communication link created by a third party for example if a video is streaming on youtube and there is a problem with that content then youtube will not be held liable but if that is brought to the notice of youtube then obviously youtube has to bring it down but suppose a video shows maliciously flag of a nation or puts question on sovereignty of the nation then youtube in this case will not be held responsible for creation of that content 
But so far, the notification brought by the government has just said that OTT platforms will now be brought under the ambit of Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. So now the ministry will come up with a guideline. What that guideline would be and how tightly the government wants to regulate OTT platform will be known only in the time to come. Today we can do only two things. We can understand what are over the top platforms and we can also discuss developments in the recent time that has led to the need of regulating OTT platforms. Over the top platforms, they are generally used in the context of streaming content online. Although they can also be used in the context of voice messages or text messages, but mostly their usage began in the context of online streaming of content. See, traditionally, streaming of video content was done on television. And you know how it used to happen. Information used to come from the satellite in form of signals that was received by a ground station. And then from the ground receiver, it was sent to many local distributors. These local distributors via cables used to provide content at home. But this cable network was taken over by DTH, direct to home. Now the satellite can send the signal directly to home. You have to have a setup box that connects the signal coming from the satellite with the television. But whether the cable network or DTH did not use internet. But now you can connect your TV with internet and you can watch YouTube on TV. You can watch any other streaming content over any application. That is bypassing the infrastructure, the distribution network and the role of companies. And hence it is named as over the top. The crucial difference between over the top services and the traditional video streaming services is that over the top platform uses internet. It gives content whether the voice message or text message or video, all of that as data. And the traditional broadcast of video via television did not use internet because internet itself is a very recent thing. And still today in India, two third of the population do not have a regular internet service. But now when the internet is penetrating deeper into society and more and more people having internet access, more and more people use mobile phone, this over the top platform is increasingly becoming more popular. And platforms like Netflix, Amazon Prime and the Desi ones like Alt Balaji, Z5, etc, etc. They are beginning to take over the regular television channels. Now let us talk about as to why there is a need for regulating over the top platforms. See, regulation is part of governance. If you look at the syllabus of GS paper 2, you find a section of regulatory bodies. Because there are various claims from different sections in society, it is the job of the government to balance the rights and duties of citizens, to bring justice, equality in society. That is a constitutional promise that government has to fulfill. So regulation is a very important job of governance in any country. And in a diverse country like India, where there is diversity in religion, economic status, caste, language, there is all more need of regulation by the state. Various kind of need. For example, religious sentiments of minorities must be taken care of. Cartelization, aggressive takeovers, they need to be avoided. Competition has to be maintained in the economy. So a level playing field among various players have to be developed. Just like regular media comes under regulation, so the over the top platforms must also come. Absence of regulation will lead to absolute freedom. But every freedom comes with responsibility. Article 19, which gives the fundamental right of freedom of expression, also mentions reasonable restrictions. And among various restrictions, decency and public morality are also mentioned as ground for putting restriction on freedom of expression. It has been observed that over the top platform 
have been violating this ground of decency. Then there is the question of principle of fairness. There must be a level playing field for different players. Traditional media comes under regulatory ambit of government. For example, there is Cinematograph Act of 1952. Films and public exhibitions are certified under this act. There is Cable Television Network Regulation Act 1995 and this applies to content appearing on cable television. But as we have mentioned in the beginning, there is no specific law for regulation of content over over-the-top platforms. Then there are regulatory bodies for traditional media, for example, Press Council of India for print media. There is Central Board of Film Certification for cinematographic films. There are also self-regulatory bodies for media houses like News Broadcasters Association, Advertising Standard Council of India. Although over-the-top platforms have recently come up with a guideline for self-regulation, but there is no consensus among various over-the-top platforms regarding that guideline. Then as we have mentioned that with penetration of internet and with increased use of mobile phone, more and more number of people are now switching to over-the-top platforms. As per recent surveys, almost 55% Indians prefer over-the-top platform over direct-to-home services. And in India, 87% people use mobile phones. According to a recent KPMG report, India will have more than 500 million subscribers on the over-the-top platforms by 2023. And during the present pandemic, the usage popularity of these platforms has skyrocketed. Because the theatres, movie halls were closed during the lockdown, many of the recent productions have been released over over-the-top platform. Since they are becoming increasingly popular and since the usage is becoming so high, it cannot go unregulated. There is another very big issue of adjusted gross revenue AGR of telecom companies. See, adjusted gross revenue means the total revenue coming from the core activities and the non-core activities. For example, if Airtel is giving you telecommunication services, that is its core activity. But if Airtel suppose has some deposits or investment in SDFC bank, and it is earning something in return, that is its non-core activity. But adjusted gross revenue includes both core and non-core activity. And as per that, they have to give the licensing fee, they have to give money in the Universal Service Obligation Fund, among other things. And the issue of adjusted gross revenue is very prominent because as per the recent Supreme Court judgment, Adjusted gross revenue will include both core and non-core activity. But the telecommunication companies since 2004-05 were paying to government only as per their core activities. So there is around 1.4 lakh crore dues to the government by these telecommunication companies. Under such financial stress, the competition coming from over-the-top services become more prominent. As we have discussed in the beginning, over the top service basically use internet. But internet comes through some infrastructure. Who has created that infrastructure? The telecommunication companies. The internet that you are able to use through your GeoSIM comes from the Geo Telecommunication Network infrastructure. Telecom companies have invested heavily in creating the infrastructure to bring internet to you. And the over the top platforms have very minuscule expenditure on the infrastructure creation. They use the internet provided by the telecom companies to make their products available to you on your phone. And they are making huge profit. So it is the grievance of telecom companies that over the top platforms must get into a revenue sharing model with these telecom companies. So that is another regulatory aspect whether over-the-top platforms be forced to get into a revenue sharing model with telecom companies. Because there is absence of legislation or regulatory body regulating these over-the-top platforms, there have been violations and Ministry of Health has reported violation of anti-tobacco rules in various instances. 
Although OTT platforms have tried to bring in self-regulation code, but there has been no consensus on the code among various OTT platforms. So that also necessitates that government must come up with a regulatory code. However, it is important that over-regulation should not be done for these platform because they are very beneficial. It is highly convenient for the consumer. You can watch anything anywhere using your mobile phone if you have internet connectivity. It also gives choice to consumers. Previously, the broadcast was on social scale. You used to watch Doordarshan, Chitrihar, the whole family watching the same content. But now the content can be personalized. You can watch whatever you wish. Over the top platform also give freedom of creativity. This new platform is relatively free from the regulations and censorship norms and also free from formulaic content generation. The general formula that the content producers, the script writers, the directors, they were following that has been broken and new innovative content is coming up on OTT platforms. OTT platforms also have opportunities to break the accepted public morality standard and present an alternative viewpoint, for example, LGBT rights. That can be taken up more liberally, which will be very difficult on the traditional TV content. OTT platforms also give huge opportunity to new talent. You must have seen many YouTubers now gone into Amazon Prime, Netflix and other platforms which could not have been thought of under traditional content streaming. They could have never come in the prime time on television. But now this is possible. OTT platforms are more liberating. They are more democratic. There is also local to global connect. All these OTT platforms, they are mostly owned by Western foreign companies. But you must have observed the content that is coming up on these platforms. They have a local context. Local artists get more opportunity to work on these platforms and when the artists get blended, there is also a blend of ideas and culture and tradition promoting global cosmopolitanism. So although regulation is necessary, but that should not become a case of over-regulation. This news article from page number 10 has been titled Home Ministry Amends FCRA Rules. Foreign Contribution Regulation Act Rules Home Ministry has relaxed the norms for farmer, student, religious and some other organizations who are not directly aligned to any political party and who are not involved in active politics. If these student, farmers or religious groups, they are not aligned to any political party and they are not involved in any active politics, then they cannot be classified as organization of political nature. And if they cannot be classified as organization of political nature, then they cannot be prohibited from taking foreign fund under Rule 3 of Foreign Contribution Regulation Rules 2011. The Rule 3 of the Rules for Foreign Contribution Regulation defines organization of political nature. And there are many parameters based on which any organization can be defined as organization of political nature. First, suppose the organization has stated political objective. Then obviously it is organization of political nature. Or if it's a trade union, but the objective includes activities for promoting political goals. If a voluntary action group participates in political activities along with the political parties, then obviously they will be also organization of political nature. Then there are other organizations, student unions, youth forums, women organization, but they are the wings of political party. Then also they will be organization of political nature. Then there are organizations of farmers, some workers, students, youth, based on caste, community line, religious line, based on language. But these organizations, even if they are not aligned to any political party, but if they take up activities that advance the political interest of those political parties, then also they will be classified as organization of political nature. The real problem comes from the sixth parameter that defines an organization of political nature. It says an organization which habitually engages 
meaning very often it engages in political actions like band, hartal, rasta roko, rail roko, jail bharo and activities like that in support of public causes. So far you saw that directly or indirectly the activity is linked with political activities, the interest of political parties. But here it is public causes. This is not related with activities of political parties or their interest. So this could be completely apolitical in nature but even then the organization would be defined as organization of political nature and then it will be prohibited from having foreign contribution. But recently Supreme Court gave a judgment and to give way for implementation of that judgment Home Ministry has actually come up with the amendment and the amendment says that organizations of farmers, workers, students, youth based on caste, community, religion, language or any other factor will only be considered as a political group if they participate in active politics or party politics. Meaning, if they are taking up public causes, then they will not be defined as an organization of political nature, which effectively means they will still have the right to have foreign contribution to carry forward their activities. Now let me quickly give you the summary of the Supreme Court judgment that effectively required this amendment. Supreme Court said that central government cannot brand an organization as political to deprive it from receiving foreign funds under Foreign Contribution Regulation Act 2010 for legitimate form of dissent to aid a public cause. But we have seen here one of the criteria to define organization of political nature was also if organization is involved in certain activities in support of public causes. But the judgment of Supreme Court is saying that if it is a legitimate form of dissent to aid a public cause, then you cannot brand the organization as political in nature to deprive it from receiving foreign fund. Since the judgment said this, so the amendment was necessary. The judgment said that it will be required to be proven that activities which are being taken to aid public cause are part of active politics or to aid political cause. But de facto, they will not be considered as organization of political nature. Supreme Court observed that any organization which supports the cause of a group of citizens agitating for their rights without a political goal or objective cannot be penalized. Meaning they cannot be branded as political organization and their right to get foreign contribution cannot be taken away. Supreme Court also said that organizations supporting buns need not be a political organization because their cause need not be a political cause. The buns can also be called by farmer organization to make their grievances heard but they may not have any political goal. If you see the present farmer protest going on in Punjab Haryana, they do not have political leaders as face of the movement or protest. Farmer leaders themselves are leading the protest. So definitely they are not political in nature or if they are that needs to be proven. By default they cannot be declared as political organizations. Supreme Court said that a balance has to be drawn between the objective of the legislation FCRA and the right of the voluntary organizations to access foreign fund. The objective of FCRA is to preserve the values of our republic. The goal is to protect the administration from undue influence of foreign powers by the means of foreign fund. But that needs to be balanced by the rights of voluntary organization to access foreign funds to pursue their activities. In conclusion, voluntary organizations which have absolutely no connection with either party politics or active politics, they cannot be denied access to foreign contribution. Supreme Court also said that organizations which channel foreign funds for political parties, they are strictly prohibited to receive foreign funds under FCRA. So in conclusion, it was this judgment of Supreme Court that required amendment in FCRA Act so that organizations which are apolitical in nature, their functioning is not unnecessarily stifled by FCRA. There is an important news on economy on page number 14. 
GDP shrank 8.6 percentage in the second quarter, pushing economy into a recession. See, yesterday RBI has come up with numbers on GDP and the number shows that Indian economy has rebounded sharply. In the first quarter of financial year 2021, the GDP contracted by 23.9%. This contraction in GDP has reduced and the number says that in the second quarter, GDP contracted by 8.6%. And RBI says that this number clearly shows that India have entered a technical recession in the first half of this financial year for the first time in its history. For the examination, you must know that recession is a fall in overall economic activity, meaning contraction in GDP, meaning negative growth for two consecutive quarters. One quarter is of three months. That means there must be GDP contraction for at least six months for the economy to be said in the state of recession. And that will obviously be accompanied by decline in income, sales and employment. So for two consecutive quarter, you must have negative GDP growth number. We had in the first quarter minus 23.9% and in the second quarter minus 8.6%. So technically we are in the state of recession. But this statement by RBI for the first time in the history might create some confusion because we know that even in the past India has seen negative GDP growth numbers and that has happened four times. For the first time it happened in the financial year 1958-59, we saw the negative growth of minus 1.2%. Then in 1966, we had the negative growth of minus 3.66%. Then during the energy crisis of 1973, we had the negative growth of minus 0.32%. In the year 1979 80 we also saw a negative growth of minus 5.2%. And from here, we were getting into the balance of payment crisis. So this time it is actually the fifth time that we have seen negative growth. Strictly if seen, this is the fifth recession that our economy is seeing. But the catch is the GDP numbers on quarterly basis is being published only since 1996. So these negative numbers that we are seeing, they were published on yearly basis. But in the definition of recession, we have seen that there must be negative growth for two consecutive quarters. So this definition cannot be applied to our economy before 1996 because we did not have quarterly numbers. So in that sense, ever since we could apply the definition of recession to our economy, this is the first time that we are seeing recession. But you must keep in mind that this is not the first time that our economy has seen GDP contraction. In relation to the rebound in our economy, the GDP going from the contraction level of minus 23.9% to minus 8.6%, it is important to note there has been rise in household financial saving. Household financial saving is actually the sum total of currency, the bank deposits, savings through debt security instruments, mutual fund, pension fund, insurance, investment in small saving schemes, saving from all sort of financial instruments, including currency and the bank deposits. But households also have financial liabilities that includes loan from banks, NBFCs and housing finance companies and other institutions. When the liabilities are subtracted from financial saving, then we get net household financial savings. And here actually it is net household financial saving that has risen. Household financial saving is very, very important parameter for the prospect of the economy. It is the household financial saving that gets translated into investment in economy, which is necessary to start the virtuous cycle and increase the growth of the economy. According to the number given by RBI, household financial saving has risen to 21.4 percentage. If you compare from the first quarter of this year, it was just 7.9% and in the preceding quarter, it was 10%. So there is a huge jump in the household financial saving. So it's a good news and economy can bounce back even further. And maybe in the next quarter or the quarter after that, we can see positive growth in our economy. 
There are many reasons for which the household financial saving has increased. One obvious reason is that the discretionary expenditure of people has reduced because of COVID-19 and lockdown. So expenditure on tourism and other discretionary activities has drastically reduced. However, it is the precautionary saving which is the main reason for increasing the household financial saving. And precautionary saving has increased despite stagnant or in many cases reduced household income. There has been high rise in the subscription to the insurance product that reflects awareness in people about life insurance, maybe because of fear of COVID-19. Additionally, the credit taken by household has not increased during COVID-19, but their deposits has increased. So as we have talked about, the net household financial saving will obviously increase when the deposit is increasing, but the credit, the liability is not increasing. So increased household financial saving is a good news, but it must be translated into investment by the efficient functioning of financial institutions. There is a news on page number 10, social infrastructure PPPs eligible for viability gap funding. The cabinet committee on economic affairs has taken a decision yesterday, expanding the provision of financial support by the means of viability gap funding for PPP projects for infrastructure development in social sector. That will include education, health, water, waste treatment, among others. The Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs also has taken a decision to extend the viability gap funding scheme till 2024-25. The scheme has been in place since 2006. But viability gap funding began in 2004 after the Kelker Committee report gave its recommendation. Kelker Committee was constituted to give recommendations for making PPP projects viable. And Kelker Committee recommended that there must be easing of funding for PPP projects. And in response to that, viability gap funding scheme was initiated by Government of India. You have to remember that Kelker Committee did not give direct recommendation for initiating a scheme like this. Kelkar committee gave recommendation to ease up the funding of PPP projects. But viability gap funding did not come directly from the recommendation of Kelkar committee report. The cabinet committee has taken decision that projects in social sectors like wastewater treatment, solid waste management, projects in health, water supply, education, etc. can get 30% of total project cost from the center. And if a state desires, then state can give additional 30% of total project cost. So altogether, the maximum support from the government in the form of viability gap funding could be 60%. Viability gap funding means a grant. That grant can be one time or that grant can be distributed over a period of time called as deferred grant. Viability gap funding is available for projects which are economically justified but are financially not viable. Economically justified meaning once the project will be completed and it will be up and running, then the investment will be returned with profit. But however, since the initial investment is very large and there is long gestation period, so it is financially not viable for any one private player to start the project. So some funding assistance is required and that funding gap is filled by the government to make the project viable. And that is why it is called viability gap funding. It began in 2004 for PPP projects that were economically justified but not financially viable. Under this scheme, 40% of total project cost is provided by Government of India and the sponsoring authority. The sponsoring authority could be a central ministry, it could be state government or it could be any statutory body. But this 40% is split between the central government which contribute 20% and the sponsoring authority which can contribute maximum 20%. However, if the sponsoring authority desires to give more assistance, it can give but the additional assistance will not be more than 20%. So the maximum funding assistance that can be given in a project by government is 60%. 20, 
plus 20 plus 20 and we have seen that in case of social sector project maximum assistance could be 60 percent 30 percent plus 30 percent but the government has announced two sub schemes to finance the social sector project under sub scheme one those projects will be catered which have at least 100 percent operational cost recovery meaning whatever your cost is going to run the project you are at least recovering that you're not making profit but you're not going in loss obviously it will be based on some estimation and for these projects the central government will provide maximum 30 percent of total project cost and the sponsoring authority will provide additional 30 percent maximum of 30 percent there is a sub scheme too that will cater to projects that will have at least 50 percent operational cost recovery for these projects viability gap funding can be given up to 80 percent but this 80 percent will be split between the central government which will be giving 40 percent and the sponsoring authority that will give rest of the 40 percent the central government can also give in this case 50 percent of operation and maintenance cost because these projects do not seem to be economically viable even the running cost will not come back so assistance can also be given for operation and maintenance and that will be maximum 50 percent of total operation and maintenance cost and again this will be split between the central government which will give 25 percent and rest of the 25 percent will come from sponsoring authority it's a very welcome decision from the central government because the social sector schemes are not financially very viable and in many cases they are also not economically viable but in the context of poor ranking of India in many socio-economic global indicators it's a very welcome step there has been an important announcement by the Ministry of Finance yesterday and the news has been covered on page number 10 with the title rupees 1.46 lakh crore outlay over five years see this announcement has been done as part of Atm Nirbhar campaign 3.0 the announcement is that 10 new sectors will be added under manufacturing production linked incentives previously under the production linked incentive scheme there were three sectors covering manufacturing of electronics component manufacturing of pharmaceuticals covering key starting materials drug intermediaries and active pharmaceutical ingredients and manufacturing of medical devices now 10 more sectors have been added to it and that is the announcement and to cover 10 more sectors rupees 1.46 lakh crore has been assigned for the scheme the new 10 sectors are these advanced cell chemistry battery electronic products or technology based products automobiles and auto components pharmaceutical drugs telecom and networking products textile products food products high efficiency solar pv modules white goods like acs and leds and specialty steel steels with special industrial grade properties for example resistance to corrosion and high tensile strength etc production linked incentive scheme has been covered intensively and beautifully by Baswasar in the dns dated 15th october 2020 so we are not going to do it here again you can quickly go through this particular section of this dns for a revision now let us do question for the day answer to yesterday's question is option c the first pairing is incorrect because the labor force participation rate is labor force by total working population not the total population into 100 the second and the third pair are correct answer would be c two and three only today's question is this consider the following statements regarding viability gap funding scheme statement one is maximum of 50 percent of total project cost can be given by the government as financial help statement two is the scheme was recommended by kelkar committee in 2004 and third statement is niti ayog is the nodal body for the scheme which of the statements given above is or are correct one only two only all of the above or none of the above 
With this, we have come to the end of the session. Do not forget to attempt the DNS quiz on our eLearn platform. I wish all of you a very happy, lively, joyful Diwali.